Now, we're seeing lots of different models explode across the country, lots of innovation from educators on the ground, from school leaders and from teachers themselves, in what blended learning looks like. And what I thought I would do is just share uh, four of the models um, high level with you, and then talk a little bit about the nuance underneath. The, the uh, big one that we're starting to see get a lot of traction is what we call the rotation model. This is where students rotate at fixed points in time between different modalities, one of which is online learning. And we're seeing a number of, um, of uh, models of, like this playing itself out in classrooms across America right now. Now, first one is station rotation. This is what I think in elementary schools is going to be uh, the biggest form of blended learning. This is my guess. But th the reason is because uh, elementary schools already tended to have sort of a station rotation model. Just all we're saying now is one of those stations is going to be online learning. And the key is to really make it robust is that the data you get from that online learning station allow it to inform what happens at the other stations. You can constantly be regrouping, do small group instruction as makes sense for the individual child, and so forth. The other one that's getting a lot of attention right now is lab rotation. It's because of this charter school out in California called Rocket Ship Education, which has been getting a lot of attention that created a learning lab where students go to for their online learning rotation and then come back to the traditional classroom. Um, my favorite of the rotation ones, to be honest, is individual rotation. The reason is that as opposed to the station rotation or lab rotation where students rotate through every single modality, in the individual rotation, students get an individualized playlist, in essence. For those of you that know School of One um, in New York City, this is what this is like, where Students basically, you say, hey, maybe two of your rotations in a row will be in online learning modalities if that's what you as the student needs. Maybe you'll, today you'll just be doing two, pro, two, uh, two uh, sessions of projects in a row because that's what you need. It's basically a playlist for the student. The characteristic that keeps it rotation is that the rotations happen at fixed points in time still. And then the last one that's obviously getting a lot of headlines right now in the popular press is the flipped classroom. Um, I kind of think of this as the low-hanging fruit of innovation, but if you're trying to get involved in blended learning, this is a really simple way to do it. Let your students do the uh, delivery of lessons from home online learning, and when they come into the classroom with you, do the real practice and application of the learning and projects and, and the work and so forth in really robust ways. Now, um, the flex model of uh, blended learning sort of pushes the bounds a little bit more. The delivery now really becomes from the online platform itself. It really disrupts the classroom as we've known it. Because now every student has an individualized program basically that makes sense for their needs. And the teacher's job in many cases will be to help pull them out as they need something different on a very flexible basis. These things don't happen at a fixed time by any means. So as you see a student struggling, maybe you see three other students struggling with the same concept, you bring them into a small group work session, instruction, whatever it might be, and that's a flex environment that we're seeing take place on the ground. Uh, credit recovery, actually, for a second, uh, really looks like a flex model in, in, in most cases. The other one we're seeing is self-blend. And this is where, this is what I think of as the ubiquitous form of uh, blended learning occurring across high schools right now, which is students are still taking one, two, three, four classes in a traditional format, and they're taking one, two, three online classes. And the difference between self-blend and flex is that the teacher is remote in the self-blend. And what most schools will say is, well, that's just distance online learning. And you're right, for that particular course it is, but from the student's experience, it's clearly blended because they're doing some of their courses in traditional format and they're doing a couple of them in online format. It's a blended experience. And then the last one, which we won't spend a lot of time on, is the enhanced virtual uh, model, which really is very similar to a full-time virtual school, with the exception that in weekly periods, students are required to come into the brick and mortar school at fixed times to interact with their teacher or peers and so forth. Now, technology is improving in a few other ways. 
In addition to the blended learning, we're seeing the communication vehicles improve night and day. If you went back, uh, let's see, in 2000 and looked at all the guides on how to do e-learning well, they all would have been on asynchronous instruction. But that's not the world in which we live now. And this is a screenshot of a virtual classroom, but I have a different question for you. How many people here use Skype? The vast majority. How many people of you, uh, if you went back uh, seven years ago, used uh, AOL Instant Messenger? Also a lot. How many of you remember the video button that you could click on the AOL Instant Messenger when you were chatting with a buddy? Anyone remember it? Do you remember it, yeah? You ever click on that thing? No, you not at all. Because if you did, it either would have crashed the computer or fizzled out in about half a second. <laughs> she was kind and didn't mention that I, work at, um, I worked at AOL uh, at that time period. But the reality was that video chat was just really not possible as a technology eight, nine years ago. Now it's ubiquitous. Through Skype and other mechanisms, we can literally communicate with anyone around the world whenever we feel like it. And so the ability to have communication and collaboration from students to students, students to teachers, teachers to teachers is unbelievable. And so with 3D screens and touch screens coming on, who knows where this technology is going to be in a few years. But the impossibility to set up some really cool blended learning environments is going to be huge. The other thing we see happening is that the content itself is improving significantly. If you went back 15 years ago, the majority of um, online learning looked a lot like my PowerPoint. Boring, flat, sequential, and with multiple choice. Increasingly, we're seeing game-based environments and exciting modalities that really start to uh, loop students in and engage them and motivate them so that they want to take ownership of their learning. And what we're seeing a lot of the providers do is start to use data in really cool ways to start to individualize those pathways and be able to say, gee, a student is struggling in something that's a prior concept, let's move them back to that and be able to fill in those chunks so we don't get the Swiss cheese problem with big holes in their education and so forth and be able to inform teachers in exciting ways. So we're seeing some really exciting opportunities. The question marks, I think, are on a lot of these practical implications. And so I have some advice for us as we implement it, and I'll, I'll stop here with these last few slides. The first thing is that as your schools are embracing these new models of learning, really start at the end. What do you want to see from students? What do you want to see from all students? Define those outcomes and then work backwards into a design process. And really make the technology the slave to your strategy not the other way around. What's really cool about this conference that you all are at is that with all of you being able to share the case studies of successful implementations and so forth, the team here is going to learn more and more what works well and what doesn't. And they're going to be able to take it back and improve for the next year. And that's the job of the uh, product managers is to coordinate that. Um, but the, uh, but the, as the customers, you guys have huge power to help influence and shape this. The third thing I would say is really don't be afraid to harness that power of time, place, path, and pace to personalize for each individual child. I think most of you probably already get this, but as you see your colleagues start to get into blended learning and so forth, a lot of teachers still will feel like, well, I have to deliver the lesson tomorrow. Well, you got 30 students in 30 different places. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you individualize for what they need? And so really being comfortable with the fact that students are going to start to own and drive a lot of this is, is tough, but it's really important. And you start to see huge benefits. Um, I'd say personalize for your circumstances, too, for those who are school leaders, not, not the teachers as much, but the principals. Be thinking about what do we do well? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. What do we do well here? And how can we use online technology to do what we don't do well? So we can't be all things to all people, particularly in these budget times. So how do we leverage the expertise of these people from the outside to really get uh, done what we want to do right now? Really think about that in a strategic way. Um, I'll just skip down to that last one, which is really shift to outcome-based accountability. We need to see our policy, get rid of micromanaging how it works on the ground, 
for educators, but I also think you can start to move into performance-based contracting with a lot of the people that you, uh, the vendors that you work with as well, so that you align the incentives so everyone's focused on those student outcomes about which you care most. And I think it's a huge opportunity for e-learning uh, companies to really leapfrog the textbook industry and so forth to really align all these incentives around student outcomes. And I, so as in general, I say get out of the mindset of beholden by the old metrics. We've seen that when the personal computer came along and disrupted the mini computer, if you had judged the personal computer by the metrics we used to determine whether a mini computer was good or bad, personal computers never would have taken off. Or they would have conformed themselves in some bizarre way to the way the industry worked. Never judge disruptive innovation by the old metrics. And so we really have to get rid of these input-based things that focus on seat time, that focus on geographic boundaries, what we thought we knew about teacher certifications and the job it is to be a good teacher, because all of those skills really change dramatically in these new worlds. And so really moving to that competency-based learning system is just critical. And I'll leave you with this last thought, which is right now we have this system built on fixed time variable learning where we basically deliver content to students. We then test and assess. And then we move students on to the next grade, subject, or body material. And only a few weeks later do they get results, or in the case of the standardized tests, a few months later get the results. And so this is pretty backwards when you think about it. We've got to flip this equation to a competency-based learning model. And as you're talking with policymakers and the boards of education and so forth around your district and state, it's important to make this voice really heard, which is we've got to flip this around so that rather than time being fixed and learning being variable, we have learning being the fixed and time being variable. And so we'll still deliver learning experiences to students. We will still test and assess. That's an important part of this. But the testing and assessment won't be used to move people on, but instead to receive real-time feedback so we know what to do next with students. And once students have truly mastered a concept, and I want to think of you to think of assessment in a big way here, not just through multiple choice tests, but through essays, projects, portfolios of work, really showing competency, once you've really mastered something, then student will move on to the next grade, subject, or body of material. Now, really what we've been doing for the last 150 years is measuring the wrong end of the student, if you think about it. I'll let you think about that for a second. <laughs> but we need to move to this competency-based learning system, not just for students, but for teachers, too, so that you can have way more control over the environment. And we can start to reward and celebrate the growth that we can make with each individual child because at the end of the day, school performance isn't about school performance as an aggregate. It's about each individual child and what they do. And so I think there's just a huge opportunity right now to transform education into a student-centric system. I think all of you are the ones on the ground leading it and taking advantage of this disruptive innovation. And throughout this day and throughout this year and the years to come, I encourage you to continue to push the bounds be in touch with me as you do so, so we can learn more and elevate that, what you're doing out there. We're creating a blended learning database where we're trying to capture all the programs around the country to help educators network with each other. Uh, it's user generated, so you can just jump on our website and it's free, just you know, upload what you're doing. Um, because we want to know and we want to create more transparency and information so that educators have networks to each other. Because together we're going to create the future. It's not just going to be one person in one place. It's all of us together to create this future for students. So I applaud what you're all doing. Thank you so much for your time this morning, and uh, best of luck to all of you.